Uh, thank you very much, uh, India Bioscience, uh, Cactus, and of course, Ignite Life Sciences. And thank you, uh, Jim Collins, uh, for joining us today in this In Conversation series, where we invite uh, experts in science and technology, but also people who have left a mark in their fields and people who our inspirations to the younger generation, because we want to connect with them uh, and to tell the younger generation what it takes to do science and what it takes to do good science. Um, till yesterday, we had almost 800 registrations. I don't know how many people have finally joined, uh, but uh, Jim, to let you know, uh, over 60% of the registrants uh, are students. These are undergraduate students at the bachelor's level, at, then at the master's level and the PhD level, almost equal numbers. Uh, so we will really uh, pitch it to the student audience uh, today. Uh, and uh, all of you who have joined us, uh, well, thank you very much for joining. Uh, I, I think you will enjoy this conversation uh, with, uh, with Professor Collins, and I'll, I'll keep calling him Jim because this is going to be an informal uh, conversation. Uh, thank you for joining us so early uh, in Boston. Uh, so uh, Jim, let me begin. Uh, yes. And, and begin by asking you uh, something that I hope will not embarrass you. Uh, you are called the father of synthetic biology. I, I'm, I'm sure that makes you feel very old, uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the important question that I want to ask is uh, to tell us a bit about your journey. Uh, and this is to really inspire the next generation of scientists, but to also drill in them some reality about how to do science. What is it that people need to do to succeed in science? Over to you, Jim. Thank you. Well, firstly, thanks for having me uh, on the podcast. Been looking forward to the conversation for some time. You know, I think there is there's much that goes into being a, a good scientist, and you know, I th I'm delighted there's so many young people uh, participating today and hopefully watching this on recording. You know, I, I think there are multiple factors to highlight. One, I think what's lost on many young folks is I think it's critically important to really develop an expertise in an area of interest. And so obviously you want to establish or find that area of interest. So I think critically, you always wanna be curious and think about exploring the world or improving your world. But then it's really committing to be an expert. And by that, it takes an incredibly long time to master the literature, master the content, to really become familiar with not just what happened last week, but what happened last year, what happened last decade, what happened many decades before. The second is that it's really, I think, critical to be willing to fail. You never want to accept failure, but you need to be able to deal with failure. And why is that, boy, most of our good ideas turn out not to be very good once we get into the lab to test them. And so you need to be able to generate a large number of ideas, but you also need to be able to handle that failure. And one of my favorite phrases is that the Successful scientist is an individual who can go from failure to failure to failure with undiminished enthusiasm. And so there's much that goes into it, but in many cases, it really starts again with that curiosity and then a commitment and a focus to really drill down on a particular topic to become that expert, generate many ideas about it, and then persevere through what are gonna be many mishaps, many failures in the lab or behind your computer as you really try to tease out nature's new secrets. Yeah. You know, uh, thinking about what you were saying, I mean, if we look at science today, uh, it's become so inter so specialized as well as so interdisciplinary that it's almost imperative that people work in large teams. Uh, they're, uh, you know, if, if you see groundbreaking discoveries now, they are coming from teams and very rarely from, from individuals. Uh, and there's also this question that worries a lot of young people is uh, how to generate 
the kind of funds that are required to do that kind of science. Uh, so some quick reflections from, from you on that as we move forward. Yeah, firstly, on the first point, you know, yes, I, I think science has certainly become much more interdisciplinary, certainly over the last three decades of my professional career. When I started as a professor in 1990, interdisciplinary work was still really viewed as being really quite superficial and not deep, not rigorous, not serious. And now it's become really the center stage as we recognize many of the most interesting problems and remaining big challenges are at the interface of disciplines. To your point, it now becomes challenging. How do you become an expert in multiple fields? And in many cases, it's impossible to do so. But my recommendation to young folks would really still to be become an expert in a particular field and become multilingual, be able to work with those in other fields, not necessarily making yourself the major advances there, but to understand what their questions are, what their challenges, what their problems are, and be able to interface. And that's, for example, happening in our work as we're introducing artificial intelligence into both antibiotic drug discovery and synthetic biology. There, in many cases, we do best with folks who can cross the bridge between the disciplines and speak to each other. To your point on team-based work is as the problems get more and more complicated, it becomes critical to be able to both create teams, lead teams, and be a part of a team. It still comes down to individual contributions, but increasingly, folks yeah. will need to be comfortable and willing to work on a team without necessarily losing their identity. And again, as you think back in the early part of my career, you still had the lone scientists of the small groups, one or two that were leading efforts. It still exists in certain areas of science, but increasingly, including in the life sciences, we're seeing large teams emerge. I think there still is the room for the introvert and the individual who largely would like to work on their own, but that individual still will need to have some set of interaction abilities in order really to be advanced schemes. Yeah. So, I mean, to summarize what you've just said, uh, I think for young people, it's, it's very important to become experts in a given field, but also to read broadly and be aware of what's happening around them. Uh, just becoming an expert in your own field uh, will possibly not make you the success that you want to be. Uh, you know, that, and that's also, very true. Yeah, you know, I, I think that what's lost on many is that that science is very much an intellectual discipline. Right. And, and to be a, a rigorous, to be a solid, to be an engaged intellectual, you need to also look beyond your field. So you need to be open. You need to have yeah. those conversations with folks across the aisle. And, and I also like to make a distinction on the, on the expert and, and a qualifier of encouragement for young people. So the distinction is that I really value expertise, but I don't like authority. So authority is very much something that's given by social structure. Expertise is earned. In fact, you can be an expert without being recognized. In authority, you need to be recognized. And again, it comes from this artifice. I was brought up by Irish rebels. So in fact, I despise authority. And I think to be a good scientist, in some levels, you've got to be anti-authoritarian and that you need to challenge convention. You need to say, ah, somebody either got this wrong or hasn't seen this or done this and I can do this. The second is, again, on the expertise, I'm very concerned that our young people spend much too much time on their smartphones and much too much time on computers, just searching, 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 and not storing content. And I think to be innovative, really critical thing is to be able to see relationships between apparently disparate bodies of content. And you can't do that via a search engine very well where you don't know the content, but our brains are remarkable in its abilities to actually draw those connections, but you gotta be willing to make the commitment to store the content and not simply search or check your next TikTok feed or your text that came in from your friends. And so I think in many cases, young scientists would be well served by leaving their cell phones at home for extended periods of time and spending time inside their head and inside the lab and inside the library. Yeah, I mean, we worry about artificial intelligence and you, you said something about it and I'll come to it. But we often forget about uh, natural stupidity that has its own value in, uh, in learning and in thinking and uh, in conceptualizing problems. Um, so let me get on to uh, this, this whole business of AI. Uh, you know, AI made news uh, recently uh, that a bot is going to defend a human in a US court of law. Uh, that's, that's remarkable. Uh, that 
that says something about how the nature of work is changing and how young people should really train themselves for, for uh, future markets. But what I want to really ask you is, how do we build features of making mistakes into AI to retain some of the serendipity that is associated uh, uh, with, with humans? Can AI look at its mistakes uh, and wonder about new ways of looking at problems? Uh, your thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting idea. Uh, you know, uh, the advances in the last year or two, particularly around language models, have been stunning, as well as efforts that we saw with AlphaFold around predicting protein structure from sequence. In terms of the mistakes, it is interesting. So in the models that we use, presently in drug discovery and synthetic biology, they make a lot of mistakes, meaning the models are not 100% accurate, not even close to it. And so in many cases, their predictions are wrong. What we don't have that capability yet is to have the machine wonder, as you said, about its mistake to reflect on it. I don't know how far we are away from such things, but it does become intriguing to think about to what extent can we take advantage of the errors or the inaccuracies or the uncertainties that are present in these models. I know an emerging area of great interest is really getting after uncertainty in the AI model so that we can better have a feeling for how, val how much value should we put in this particular prediction. But again, to your point, you know, we don't have sentient machines yet. We don't have machines with consciousness mm -hmm. or reflection. And that's where, again, the humans have a great role. And I think the big advances and certainly in my world of life sciences and drug discovery and biotech for AI will come from the groups that best integrate human intelligence with machine intelligence. And as the young folks think finding your place, I think figuring out how you as the human fit in that human machine interface is where the great advances are gonna come. And in part, the complexity of biology and chemistry, which is in many cases beyond our grasp, but it's still well beyond the grasp of the machines. But together, I think we can actually better harness those complexities to advance our understanding and advance new therapies, new treatments, new diagnostics. Yeah. So, you know, on synthetic biology, on synthetic life forms, uh, continuing along the same line of thought, uh, should we simply sidestep the messiness that life has uh, by producing simpler devices? Uh, or is this messiness uh, of biology needed for us to sort of feel human? Hmm. Uh, yeah, so what's interesting, you know, synthetic biology is really making impressive advances, but they still are steps along the way. And in many cases, we are trying still to build very simple devices, biological ones that can be uploaded into a living cell, be it a bacterium or a human cell, or analyzed in a cell-free system. One of the side efforts going back now two decades has really been to understand the messiness, the noise in these systems. They're highly noisy at the molecular level. And the idea of looking at stochasticity and gene expression really was a central focus for synthetic biology with pioneering work by Michael Illowitz, Alexander Udenard, and efforts from William Blake in my lab. I think you bring up an interesting point. I do think that the messiness is in part what makes living systems quite interesting. It's in part what enables them to evolve and change in the face of different challenges and select for new and improved functions. Um, to what extent we can better take advantage of it is kind of remains on the table, even from a modeling standpoint, I don't think we have properly and fully embraced the stochasticity, but it becomes interesting of putting it in as a feature versus try to removing it from our models. Okay. Yeah, um, Jim, let me turn to uh, your own journey. Um, you know, as, as you are aware, I am in Oxford uh, at this time. And, you know, Rhodes House is on my frequent walks around town. And I see how they hold you in high esteem as a former Rhodes Scholar and as a global leader. Um, you studied and now work at some of the best global universities. What, in your view, sets apart a world-class university and you know, what should our educators be looking at? Tell us from your own experience. 
Yeah, you know, that it is an interest, very interesting question. You know, the, the tried answer, which everyone gives, is really at the heart of the university. It's, it's the students and the faculty. It really much comes down to that, but it also gets to the spirit of the institution. And let me speak a bit to Oxford. So really, I think my time at Oxford, which was in the late 80s as a Rhodes Scholar and doctoral student, really was the defining intellectual experience of my life. And why was that? Well, it really was, I think, due to the college system that Oxford has and the intellectual environment that came out of that in as follows, that I was at Balliol College and I had the opportunity to uh, live in Hollywell Manor, which was their graduate center. So we had about 120 grad students in our center. And the middle common room was this remarkable space where at any hour of the day, you could walk in, sit down at the set of couches and both read the newspapers, but have an interesting discussion with folks well outside your discipline. But then our college graduate center, I was maybe one of two engineering students. So I would sit with mathematicians, I would sit with political philosophers, I would sit with literature students and engage in these discussions that would go on for many hours. At times it'd be exhausting. In fact, at times you'd have to avoid the middle common room if you had a long, exhausting day in the lab. It similarly then extended up to the senior common room. I was, had the opportunity to become the assistant prefect, so effectively kind of the lead uh, graduate assistant in Hollywood Manor and had dining rights then at high table. And there, a few times each week, I could go and meet with fellows over a meal and talk broadly about multiple topics, sometimes just current events, but oftentimes rich intellectual discussions. It's a very special opportunity that is lost in, in the American system. So the American system, I've been now part of the American system for over 30 years. I've yet to see that, where you have regularly getting together with folks outside your discipline, we're getting regularly together with folks at different levels in the academic hierarchy. And I think this is what made... Oxford what makes Cambridge very special. Now, when you look at the broader um, areas, it, it really becomes, and universities, it, it really comes to supporting the folks. I think many universities lose sight and end up focusing on infrastructure or in the US on athletics. And I think really our heart and soul is training the next generation. And I think more money needs to go into focus on the students and support faculty. You know, to your point on, Support, no question, it's a big part for doing big science. But you know, my experience, and it's counter to many of my colleagues, but is that I have not found yet a good scientist who does not have money to do his or her work. Almost every scientist I know wants more money, but every good scientist has the support to do their work at some level. And thus, if you, if you have that good idea, if you have the talent that can execute, I think there'll be support to advance you moving forward. You have to fight, you have to argue for it, make for it, but, but it's available and it should not be the deterrent. So many of my colleagues will say, oh, it's a horrible profession, I'm spending most of my time searching for money. I spend very little money searching for money, many, many little time searching for money. Yeah. And instead focus on what makes me happy and excited, which is trying to go after the next challenge in, in bioengineering. Yeah, so what I take, take away from your answer is really something that we were discussing earlier. Uh, and that is for young people to become experts in what they do, but to also read and think more widely. Uh, uh, and you know, what you were telling about conversations in the common room, uh, you know, yes, do go and talk to people outside your own domains. I mean, if you're a chemistry student, do talk to a history student uh, and see what they are reading, what they are thinking. Uh, yes. So that's that's very important. And yes. to educators, I, I, I don't think in our universities, people should, uh, should understand that uh, the sole purpose of a university is to improve the uh, education and experience of the students. A yes. university exists for students. It doesn't exist for the comforts of faculty. And I think that's... that's right. That's, that's very, very important to understand. Yes. So now let's let's turn to some of your own work in synthetic biology and related uh, matters. So Jim, your lab recently produced the world's first AI-driven antibiotic. Uh, tell us a bit about this project in your lab and how can synthetic biology stop antimicrobial resistance, uh, for example, uh, or do you think nature or evolution or whatever we may call it, will always be one step ahead. Yeah, so a few points. One, we really took on this challenge of antibiotic drug discovery because of the antibiotic resistance crisis. 
So as many may know, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have a second infectious disease crisis that's a global challenge, and that is around antibiotic resistance. And we're in this in part for a couple of reasons. One is that we've been overusing antibiotics for decades, <clears throat> leading to resistance that's increasing decade upon decade. And these resistance strains, which in the past were limited to hospitals, are now found in our communities, in our childcare centers, on our athletic fields, in our universities. And this unfortunately coupled with a collapsing economic market for antibiotics companies, where fewer and fewer biotechs and pharma are focusing on antibiotics, largely for economic reasons. They're very expensive to make, but they're sold very cheaply for only acute treatment periods. It's estimated that we don't address the antibiotic resistance crisis. This was done by a UK commission. By 2050, we'll have more than 10 million deaths per year from antibiotic resistant infection. So more than cancer globally. We took on this challenge to see, could we turn to AI to fill the antibiotic discovery gap? What's maybe lost on many young people on this call is that the golden age of antibiotic drug discovery was in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, so before I was born, before the microbiology revolution, before the biotech revolution, before the AI revolution. And so our team teamed up with Regina Barzilay and Tommy Jocola to see, could we use AI to fill this gap? And we did a very straightforward product where we basically brought together 2,500 different compounds, including 1,700 FDA approved drugs and 800 natural compounds, applied them to E. coli to see which exhibited antibacterial activity, took that information along with the structure of each compound and trained a deep neural net to associate the different structural features of those compounds with being an antibiotic or not an antibiotic, took the trained model and then applied it to very large libraries of compounds looking for antibiotics that are predicted or compounds that are predicted to be an antibiotic, not to be toxic, and that don't look like existing antibiotics so you can avoid resistance. And from this, we identified one such compound we call Halicin, which turned out to be remarkably potent against multi-drug resistant, extensively drug resistant, and pan-resistant bacterial pathogens. And one of the more potent novel antibiotics we discovered in decades. We're advancing this now into clinical trials, but very excited that we think the power of AI coupled with synthetic biology can actually give us an unfair advantage in the battle of our wits against the battle of the genes of the superbugs to see if we can get one step ahead. Now, to your point, we're always going to face evolution. So no matter what we come up with to kill or to inhibit the growth of bacterial pathogens, I believe eventually resistance will arise. Evolution is very clever. These bugs want to replicate. They want to go on. And so we need to continually innovate in order to come up with new material. I think AI offers tremendous possibilities, again, to enable us to embrace the complexity of biology in order to come up with these new compounds and molecules. I think synthetic biology also gives us an edge in a couple ways, or multiple ways. One is new tools to probe how pathogens are responding to compounds to give us insight into the actions of drugs. And second is really ways in a controlled manner to change the biology of the, drug, of the bugs, producing in this case engineered or even cell therapy based ideas, similar to what we have for cancer, but now going after infections. Related to that, I think also synthetic biology opens up interesting possibilities of enabling us to really harness the power of the immune system to better go after bacterial infections. In many cases, you're not completely clearing the infection as a result of chemotherapy and now leaving to the immune system, but the bugs have also figured out ways to evade the immune system. And so I think it's a tremendously exciting time that can bring these new platforms to bear, but we need more young people, many, whom are or maybe listening to this webinar to come into this space where there are exciting tractable problems that need young, brilliant minds to make new advances. Uh, two points, Jim. Uh, so how do you ensure that the antibiotic that you're discovering uh, is targeting a new pathway instead of just targeting established pathways? Because for bugs, it will be easier to, to evade. Uh, yes. Yeah, you know, your point, the latter is the spot on is that if you're targeting the same, say, protein target or pathway than existing antibiotic for which there's already right. resistance, it's unlikely that new compound would evade. So we, we actually still do start with phenotypic screens. So we're actually not target-based. We're looking at the biological response of okay. the bug to the screen. Two is that to get after an attempt to find new compounds, new chemistries going after new targets is that we 
specifically put in as a criterion that the new compounds of interest to us are ones that don't look anything like existing antibiotics. And so the underlying assumption of that limit, that, that threshold, that yeah. filter, is that if it doesn't look like something that we have, then it's probably not hitting something that's already developed some right. form of resistance. And, and where does this particular name come from? So the name Hallison was actually just a clever take on HAL, which was the AI computer in ah. Stanley Kubrick's 2001 Space Odyssey. <laughs> so we thought it was a nice little yeah. tribute to, to that movie. It was, it was actually a killer AI lab, a killer AI computer, but now it's in, they wanted to go after humans. This was a killer AI compound that doesn't go after humans, it goes after bacteria. Right, yeah. Uh, moving on, uh, you know, what you think is the scope for synthetic organisms that, you know, do things that we want them to do, for example, bacteria that eat plastics, for example, and what yeah, might be the unforeseen dangers uh, of synthetic biology? Yeah, so I think the scope, I think the potential is tremendous. So the field of synthetic biology is a little over two decades old, and we're engineering organisms and cell free systems with synthetic gene circuits and other components, endowing them with novel functions for a variety of applications. I think we're seeing these living technologies, excuse me, really beginning to impact broad segments of society, whether it's leading to improvements in food and water so we can use microbes to lead to better crops, bioenergy, challenges in sustainability, including this idea, can we use bacteria to degrade plastics? Can we use bacteria to right, algae to enhance heat tolerance of coral reefs, and then health challenges. So let me speak to the latter. The last is that's our main focus. We and others have been engineering bacteria to serve as living diagnostics and living therapeutics. So for example, in our lab, we've shown you can engineer bacteria to detect and treat cholera. More recently showed you can engineer bacteria to prevent gut dysbiosis during antibiotic treatment. Right. We're currently advancing efforts to see, can we engineer bacteria to go after colorectal cancer? Can we engineer bacteria to treat various gut-related illnesses and also address neurodegenerative conditions. Notably, a company that I helped found, Synlogic, has four human trials underway using engineered bacteria to go after a range of metabolic disorders, including PKU. So they're engineering, for example, PKU, bacteria that can degrade phenylalanine, that's a nasty toxic metabolic byproduct, to subclinical levels in individuals that lack the enzyme to break it down and have positive phase two data moving out to a phase three. You know, the, the, there are always potential dangers with new technologies. And with synthetic biology, I think the concerns are, do you engineer a bacteria that has unintended consequences on the environment or maybe on the patient's bodies? And I think we as a community have really engaged the public, engaged philosophers and engaged legal experts to explore what those could be and to put in appropriate safeguards. So an area of growing interest is putting in appropriate biocontainment schemes right. that can prevent accidental release or that can contain the system if it's going to the patient's body and remove it if there's an adverse effect or to contain it in the plastic degrading facility or in the coral reef area and remove it if there's an adverse event. Okay. Um Let's let's move to the nervous system, uh, and you know you can can we make synthetic brain? Uh, I mean, how do we solve the problem of retrieving information that is stored in the neuronal circuits and and rewinding this information so that we can see the information as the functioning brain sees it? I mean, the brain is certainly far more complex than any of the algorithms or so far, the, the best computers so far. Yeah, yeah. What do you think the future holds? Well, I think the future is incredibly exciting and promising. And, and certainly the, the efforts to grow, create small neuronal systems, either networks or organoids has been growing. So there is an effort around neuronal organoids. So can you have small amounts of neural tissue in a dish? The challenge there is that it's very difficult at present to really establish known connections or certain architecture. And so we're allowing it to kind of grow and now analyze. I think there remains big challenges on how do we heal damaged neurons? So can we take advantage of various efforts with induced pluripotent stem cells 
to create means to repair injury to neurons and or to replace neurons that are lost as a result of aging or disease. There is a lot of interest amongst tech folks in the US, probably on the West Coast of looking at efforts to create neural stimulators, means to interface electrodes with neurons in the brain that would allow somebody to control the device and or gain access. I think there are fascinating challenges in that space, but it's interesting that people are putting investment there. I think we have a lot of science to do. So to one of the earlier topics, I think there's still much, much to be learned about how our brains function, how it stores information, how information is retrieved, how consciousness arises, one of the big central challenges, of course, of science. And I think it's an exciting space to get into. I think our ability, our tools have improved, but need improvement. We really don't do a great job of being able to track multiple neurons at a neuron level and understand their connections. But we're seeing various efforts that are expanding that. And I think more and more insights from neuroscience, I think, will give us additional insights on how to design better and more human-like AI algorithms. And so I think it's going to be a, a tremendously exciting next decade or two, in part because we only know very, very, we only know just a little bit about what's happening in our, in our nervous systems. Yeah. You know, Jim, you're, you are such a productive scientist, and I want to ask you two questions. Um, one is, what do you do first thing in the morning that motivates you for the day? Mm. And the second is, how do you maintain a work-life balance uh, in, in, all this, uh, um, in all this race and in, in all this, uh, you know, bid to do better every day. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, a few things. One, you know, I, I, I love being a scientist, love being a bioengineer. I can't wait to get up in the morning to, to actually work on interesting challenges with, with my, my exciting team here. You know, I've known to the young folks, um, you know, and, and I'll qualify this, that you know, I, I encourage, again, young folks to multiple times, you know, become an expert, really master the literature. And many times they express anxiety that the literature is just too large that they can't get their arms around it. And I tell them, well, you need to start and you need to make a commitment and then you need to make a daily commitment. And I share with them as a setup to your first question is that I'm 32 years now, a professional academic. The first thing I do when I get up is I check the literature. When I open up my computer, I check and search through what's being published in synthetic biology, what's being published in AI and antibiotics and print out those papers or look them online, study them and see what's happening. And so it gives me a sense of, okay, what's happened in literature? What's happened today that I should be up on? Uh, you know, I think we keep going after, we have so many challenges. You know, the one thing that I have limited resources is time. And uh, I get anxious at how much more time do I have where I can be productive. And so it's motivating to keep going. But having said that, and for young folks, it is incredibly important to have good balance. And so you need to have friends, you need to have family, you need to take breaks, you need to go for the long haul. I mean, I've been going at it for three decades, I'd like to have another three decades, if not even more. And so you need to pace yourself and have those friends and family. Why? Because again, you're gonna fail most of the time. Most of the time my experiments don't work. The great ideas we have in my office, that A should go to B, should go to C. Usually if I get in the lab, A doesn't go to B, B doesn't go to C. And if you don't have friends, if you don't have family to support you and they go hang, and to celebrate the successes, but also to kind of comfort you when it's not going so well, which is the more common. Boy, it'd be really hard. And so, yes, you have you should be focused. Yes, you need to commit, but not at personal expense, not at the expense of your mental health, not at the expense of your physical health. And so you, you need to set boundaries. And as you become a professional, I tell so many young folks, the most important word in your vocabulary is no. And you know, it's easy as, you know, if you're good at what you do, you're gonna have many, many opportunities. It's easy, but it's still gonna be hard to say no to the opportunities you don't want. But you also have to say no to a lot of opportunities that look great in order to maintain that balance. And oftentimes young people just take on too many things. And when you get overcommitted, now you're gonna, most things are gonna start failing. And so you need to also say no to maintain that balance. You need to say no to maintain excellence in what you do and to commit to always having excellence. You can control your excellence is I think critical to 
keeping excited, keeping advances. But also by having that excellence, you can also say no to many things and just say, look, I need to focus and also keep myself happy and balanced. Yeah, well, I'm I'm so glad you said yes to this conversation and uh, didn't <laughs> say no. Uh, so, um, you know, a lot of young people think that uh, when you're doing science, especially those who are outside of science, they think that you have a eureka moment every day. Uh, well, that doesn't happen. And as you rightly said, uh, most experiments fail. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, how do you deal with that? How should young people deal with that? The, the, the fact that you're not going to have a eureka moment every day and that most things that you do will fail. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, I think you want to have to, you know, accept is a hard thing, but you need to, you need to be willing to have that as the environment you're stepping into. Uh, you know, maybe to start, take a step back, you know, my encouragement again for many young people in my lab is, boy, you really should generate a lot of ideas and try to generate a lot of good ideas. And why? Because most of your good ideas, no matter how good you are, really aren't going to be that very good, even though they sound good, they're not going to be good. But if you have a lot of ideas, now you've got options. You also need to leave yourself open. So to look to your point of trying to train machines to take advantage of serendipity, but some of the more interesting things that scientists will uncover are really serendipitous discoveries where you're testing for A, but B emerges. You really wanted to hope, you know, we have our hypotheses. You want A to be correct, but in fact, this B, this other observation came out and that good scientists who can tease that out and be open to it is key. So it's recognizing it even in the so-called failures is often a lot of value. You can learn a lot. And so if, if your goal, you don't want to become a scientist to become famous. You don't want to be a scientist to make those eureka moments per se, although that's the nice benefit if you're really good. It's really that you want to, you're curious. You want to learn more. You want to uncover it. Maybe you, you want to help folks. And so it's recognizing even in, again, those failures, those trip ups, there's, there's often value in there. And you just go and say, how, how can I get there? Again, another point that to come back to, you know, how to deal with it. And hopefully you find a good supportive lab with a good supportive advisor and or you create a good supportive lab if you're the faculty member with friends, with colleagues who are going through similar things. I think to our earlier point, I don't think our academic systems set folks up well for the failure you have as a regular scientist and that the very top students you're getting A's regularly. It's set up where there's very clearly an answer. You give the answer, you figure out the answer. You know, in many cases in my world, it's not clear there's an answer or that you're going to be able to get to the answer. There's no answer to the back of the book. Oddly, I think athletics, which I, I had a, a good set of experiences, set you up better to be a scientist in that even the very best athletes fail on a daily basis. The basketball doesn't go in. They drop a ball. They don't run as fast as they like. Somebody else ran faster than them. And thus putting yourself in an environment where you're enabled to fail and you're given the opportunity to come back and try again. Like athletics is I think a very good training ground to become a scientist. And that even when my experiment fails, I can run that experiment again, or I can come up with a new experiment. And if you're hungry, if you're competitive, if you're interested in trying to find that answer, you're going to now come back and try again. And so again, it's having that support structure, having a lot of ideas and having the right attitude about it and taking on this challenge. Cause again, to the earlier point I made, nature does not reveal her secrets easily. And you have to be persistent and willing to deal with a lot of setbacks. That's, that's wonderful. Um, I mean, the point that you made about progress in science not being linear, you, you don't always go from A to B to C as you had planned in your head. Yeah. But, you know, you go through a lot of diversions uh, to, to reach uh, uh, somewhere. Yeah. But the point is that if you're not, if your mind is not prepared to see those, uh, those other paths, yeah. you'll miss them. Uh, That's right. And that, and one comes back again uh, to the same issue of uh, reading more widely and preparing your mind for, uh, for some of those other paths uh, that you may encounter uh, yeah. So, Jim, we've been talking for almost 40 minutes, and I would like to give some time to questions that people sure. have submitted. So, folks, what I'll do is uh, I've, I've uh, pulled out some questions from those that were submitted earlier, 
And then hopefully we'll also get a chance to answer some of the questions that are coming in through the Q&A box. Uh, that will be later. Um, so uh, let me start with a question that Anurag is asking. Uh, he's asking you, uh, Dr. Collins, have you thought about any scenario regarding any important question which you may now deal with in a different way? Uh, what he's asking is, you've done something. Uh, now do you think I should have done it better? And are there any examples of that? You know, it, it's an interesting question. I think, uh, I think less so in the actual practice of science, but more so in being a lab director. And probably the, 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 you know, again, encouragement I give for my young folks who are thinking about starting their own lab is that if you wanna be a great lab director, recruit great people. And probably the biggest mistakes I've made as a lab director is when I've hired too quickly in order to fill a slot for say a grant. And, and I didn't really find the person who was the right person to fit our lab. But because you now make a commitment to that person, you, you really need to follow through on that commitment. And oftentimes it's just not a right match. So I think, I think it's really on the recruitment and building of the team where I've made some of my bigger blunders that I have often reflect on and say, boy, I really messed up there and I need to do better. Yeah, yeah, I, I can relate to that. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> the next question is uh, from Diva Jyoti. Uh, has asked multiple questions, but I'll pull out two. Uh, the first is, what do you think are the top three challenges in synthetic biology where AI can be, take a leading role? Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll maybe frame that as one answer, but I'll have then a few prongs. I think it's an exciting time to now introduce AI into synthetic biology and why. The two big challenges I think that AI can get after is one, we still don't, know many of the design principles that are most appropriate to create the components we're trying to do. Biology is not yet an engineering discipline. Second is that we still lack a large set of well-characterized components, parts, to build synthetic gene circuits. When I look at the field, again, we're now a little over two decades old, we still largely reuse about three dozen parts, a few dozen parts. And the example I give is as if we're asking electrical engineer to build a professional circuit, electrical circuit using a child's electronics kit that has often a few dozen parts. We would never ask somebody from Intel or another major electronics firm to do that. And yet that's what we're asking for synthetic biology. Mm -hmm. I think we're an exciting opportunity where we can launch say a synthetic, a synthetic biology AI project wherein we're using AI to look at very large libraries of synthesized components that have been sequenced, functionally characterized, and now train deep neural nets that can be used both to build new components as well as search out new components and to use those models also to infer underlying design principles. So I think you know, it, it, that we've not yet seen it on a large scale, but we probably will in the next few years, major advances in just this way of using AI to take on these two challenges in synthetic biology. The, the other question is also interesting. Um, did you have some visions of synthetic biology 10 years ago that haven't been fulfilled yet? I'm sure you do, but. <laughs> you know, that's again, a very interesting question. You know, thinking 10 years, so back, you know, about halfway through where the field was, we were just really beginning to push the idea that living therapeutics, engineer bacteria would make a big difference. I think much of it has come to fruition but I'm still surprised at how long it's taking to move it towards an approved product. So I'll, I'll say that probably the remaining one is that I'm surprised we don't yet have an approved therapeutic on the market that's based on these living therapeutics. I think we very soon will. I think Syn Synlogic is getting very close um, and I'm very confident their phase three trials will be successful. But I suspect that's probably where it's still come up a bit short from what I would okay. have thought 10 years ago. Okay. Uh, another question from a student, uh, Prana, uh, who's asking, uh, what are the ethical issues around synthetic biology? 
You know, there, there are many. And, you know, at a high level, any new technology can be dual use. And same with synthetic biology, in this case, not being a biological technology. So it's, can you have appropriate safeguards in place where individuals are not going to engineer pathogens or human constructs that could be harmful to humans or broadly the environment? The second is, could there be significant unintended consequences of engineered organisms that we're releasing in the environment, whether it's for farming or for even for environmental sustainability? And there the challenge is how do you contain something that itself might not be appropriately contained? And that is, it becomes a central challenge as we're seeing now advances really to address things such as climate change, address food and water limitages um, that I think we as a field need to keep the discussion going with the broader segments of our society. Okay. Um, staying with, uh, with ethics, here's an interesting question. Uh, what is more important for a budding researcher, following research ethics or being secretive? What is more important, an article publication or getting a patent? <laughs> well, so the first question is a very easy one. I think it's it's so much more important to be ethical. Uh, I think that's a front and center. You always want to have high integrity, and really in whatever you do, whether as a scientist or as a citizen, as a as a family member, as a parent, you always want to be ethical. I, I for one, actually don't like secrecy from the science side. I think we need to talk about our work freely. And uh, to an earlier point of our discussion, I think much of science arises from interesting and extensive discussions and conversations. I very much like to talk about our work well ahead of publication. And my always view is that boy, ideas are easy uh, and it's the easy part of science. The execution is very, very difficult. And then in terms of publication versus pen, well, you know, it very much depends on what aspect of science are you working on? If you're an academic, then no question a paper is more important than a pen. But if you're in a company, in most cases, no question, a paper in most cases would be more important. I'm sorry, a pattern would be more important than the paper. So, you know, it depends. And what also is lost on some is that at least in the US system that even a publication, a paper, a patent becomes a publication. So within some number of months after you submit your patent, it's published and it actually becomes a citable piece. And you look in Google Scholar, many of the paper, many of the items that are being cited are actually patents. You know, if you look at Bob Langer's citations, some of his very, very well-cited items are actually patents. Yeah. Um, there's a question by Ruchi who's asking, where should we draw the line between synthetic and real? Are we interfering with evolution? Well, I'm not sure that it's easy to draw the line between synthetic and real. Although for me, it would be if I'm creating something that is not in nature, I would view that at some level as being characterized as synthetic. You know, are we interfering with evolution? I'm not sure if interfering is the right way. In some cases, we're harnessing evolution through means of directed evolution to, for example, improve enzymes. In other cases, we might be trying to counter evolution. So for example, in these living therapeutics that I mentioned, in many cases, it's a challenge to prevent the bacterium or the microbe from mutating the circuit you introduced that might put a metabolic burden on the bug. And so we try to counter, or let's say interfere with evolution in those cases so that we can keep our synthetic biology constructs functioning. And so there are adverse effects to evolution from the symbiocide that yes, we would interfere with, but broadly, I wouldn't view our efforts as really interfering with evolution. It's maybe just kind of putting it off or tweaking it in many different ways. Yeah. Okay, so um, a question from Shiv Shankar, uh, who's asking, is there any moment in your life uh, that changed your life completely, personally or professionally? Um, I guess I'll maybe answer a bit on changing completely a bit, and that completely is, is a hard thing to get after, but yes, I've had... Yeah. You know, many events that have changed my life. So to your earlier point of discussion where, you know, science rarely, if ever, progresses linearly. You know, A doesn't go to B, doesn't go to C. But also one's career doesn't progress linearly. And then you may have your plans. I'd like to go from A to B to C to D to E. 
But in fact, you know, you're doing this random walk of sorts and responding to different stochasticities. And many of the new directions that I took in my career, and I changed directions multiple times, came from unexpected interactions or unexpected events where I met someone, they said something to me, or they challenged me to take on a problem. And in fact, most of those major changes came from those interactions. And so they were really from unexpected or unplanned conversations that I took as an opportunity to go after a new problem or open up a deal. So it happens a lot. And so again, young folks, often you know, very high intense, triple A type characters, think they can plan everything out. And boy, you know, life usually gets in the way of that. And again, I encourage young people to be open to that because of what makes for interesting career is interesting general lives. If you're open to these stochastic events that could change, I'm not sure completely again is the right way that I'd be comfortable answering, but can change your life significantly. Um, I'll, answer, I'll ask you some of the questions that have come through the Q&A box. Uh, and let me start with a question that you dealt with earlier when we asked you about if there was something you could change, what would you change? So mm. uh, somebody is asking, didn't, I don't know the name here, uh, how do you choose the personnel that work with you? What do you look for? Yeah, that's an interesting. So, you know, I, I think front and center, I'm looking for somebody who's intellectually engaged. What does that mean? It's somebody who, who likes to talk about ideas. Preferably, I like somebody who has a lot of ideas, but in particular, somebody who, who talks about ideas, who thinks deeply in an engaged manner. You can be from many different disciplines, but it's really that intellectual engagement I think is front and center. Second, you know, I like people who are ambitious. Now you can be quiet, that's fine, but you need, you need to be driven, you know, whether it's personal ambition broader or global ambition, but ambitious people matter. And then three, you need to be nice. I, I deal with a lot of difficult people. As an academic, we have many, many difficult colleagues, but I like nice people. I don't like bullies. I don't like, uh, uh, mean people. So you can't be a bully. You can't be mean. You can be a little difficult. You can be different. I definitely like diversity broadly defined, but it's really that intellectual engagement. It's somebody who's ambitious and somebody who at heart is nice and, and wants to help others, both in the group and, and broadly through, through discovery and through, through invention. Well, I'm, I'm glad you said that, Jim, because, you know, when, when young people hear about leadership, the one very important word that they don't often hear is that leaders are also very generous. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, essentially in this world, what goes around comes around. Uh, it's very true. You know, I, I'm involved with a number of research institutes and, and have observed many. I think along those lines, I think the very best research institutes are those that have leaders who are magnanimous. Yeah. So leaders who really think about the institute, the young folks, their colleagues, their faculty, and every day are thinking, how do I advance others versus themselves? And I think the worst institutes are those that have a cult of personality around a leader who's only thinking about himself or herself. So a narcissistic yeah. leader, I think is horrible. And it's really not a leader. It really, if any, it, it's, it's maybe just a figurehead at the, at the top of a cult. And, and those make for very bad research institutes. And frankly, I think they make also for very bad research labs on a smaller level. Yeah. Um, a question has come from Oshumi, uh, who's asking uh, about students losing interest in research and science for the sake of getting a job. Uh, uh, because most students are afraid that they will be stuck in a PhD for years and PhDs are underpaid and the career trajectory later on is also very uncertain. Uh, any advice for them? Uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's a challenging question to unpack. You know, I think, uh, I think you need to pursue your passions. Now, I'll give you, you know, there's a very common kind of American maxim around not quitting. You shouldn't quit. You should persevere. And, it's, and the, the corollary is lost in many, and that is you should not quit if you really want something and go in. If you're in a situation that you don't like, if you're in a situation that you're miserable, if you're in a situation that just is imagine where you're going, quit. 
move on, go find something else. And so it's also critical that I think a lot of grad students become grad students because they don't know anything else. They've been a student all their life. Oh, now go to grad school. Well, you know, that's not the point of grad school. Grad school is really to master a new area and prepare as needed for the next stage in your career. So it, all, it comes with sacrifice, comes with commitment. So, you know, you should find a lab that matches what your time frame is, that matches your interest. But boy, if you lose interest, you should figure something else out. Now, if you're only six months away from finishing or a year, well, you, you should probably finish it off, think about some cost. But I think it's always continually challenge yourself on where do you want to go? What do you want to need? And in fairness, that many of us have different challenges. There might be financial challenges. There might be health challenges. There might be family challenges. Say, I've now got to change course. I had a brilliant postdoc who wanted an academic career, but due to financial challenges for his or her family, made a change to jump out of the postdoc into an industry role. And in this case, the individual is doing brilliantly, but made a change as a result of that. So I think it's always reflecting and, and do your due diligence. Again, in this world where there's so much information literally at our fingertips, I'm amazed at the number of young people who don't do the due diligence before they make big decisions. Find out what it's like to be a grad student, find out what it's like to be a medical student, find out what it's like to be a professor, a postdoc, and reflect, is that what you wanna do? And if it is, or if it's what you need to do to get to it, then do it and commit. But if it's not, then evaluate. and. Don't waste your time and don't waste other time, other people's yeah. time. So the bottom line is do what makes you happy. Do what you're excited about. And if you're yeah. excited about something, don't let go of it. Uh, That's right. But then you can't be excited about every new thing that comes along the way. And again, getting back to the same point, uh, to be excited about something, you really have to begin to understand it. And, right. and, and to read more deeply about it. That's so right. I keep coming back to this point to our younger audience that, uh, you know, Wikipedia and WhatsApp is not the solution to your problems on the future. That's right. Read, read good things. Uh, That's right. They will, they will help you in the long way. That's right. But you know, and picking up on that, just quickly on that point too as well, that I see increasing from my young folks, and maybe it's changed given that Twitter seems to be changing, but many of my young folks do their literature search, I'll do in quotes, from Twitter. They just see what's being sent around Twitter. And I would say, don't do that. Do your own search, unbiased, around themes and topics of interest. And two, read the paper. Reading the paper does not mean just reading the title. Reading the paper does not mean even just reading the abstract. You need to read the paper. And being part of a journal club that considers one paper every month is not being up on the literature. It will teach you how to critically evaluate a paper. But you need to put in time basically every day as a young scientist to see what's happening and gain an in insight into the literature. Yeah. We're, we're down to the last two minutes, Jim. Um, okay. I'll just finish off by asking a question about chatbots. And how, how, how do you see uh, chat GBT? Uh, do you think it will become a problem? And then you can end by whatever finishing statements you would like to make. Yeah, so, you know, I, 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 again, I think there's been amazing advances in these language, large language models, including chat GPT3, GPT3. And, you know, I, I think uh, we're seeing a lot of folks struggling in the US from the education side of how do we deal with this this machine that can generate text that could pass as homework or as, as exam answers. And I think we as many need to get a handle on that. And I think, uh, I hope young folks won't be too tempted by it because you should value what you can create. You need to value your output. And it's gonna be a tool, I think maybe a useful tool that can get after things. I guess at a high level to kind of finish off, uh, you know, I think it's a tremendously exciting time to be a young person who has interest in science and engineering. There are so many discoveries to be made. There are so many interesting problems. There's so many interesting challenges. I alluded earlier to my interest in time. I wish I was 30 years younger and starting out and giving myself 30 years additional runway. I think, as I said, I'd like to think I have still 30, at least 30 years of professional life, but it's a tremendously exciting time. So I you know, encourage folks to explore possibilities, find where your passions are. You likely will have multiple passions. And, and decide where you can begin to make impact. And again, I wish you all well on your, on your journey. Uh, it, it's a great time. I'm very optimistic for what the future holds for all of us. 
And uh, I want to thank uh, you for this really marvelous conversation. I want to thank everybody for joining the webinar. Thank you very much, Jim, for joining us and, and for really uh, speaking from your heart. Uh, and I hope that the young folks who are listening to you will take some lessons from it uh, and, and uh, do well in life. Uh, thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.